the leader there. Scaife wants the outcome here. Ambrose gets out in front. So with an efficient stop from SBR and the missed gear from Mark Scaife, the tables are turned in favour of the Pertec Falcon. I think, Neil, you just encapsulated what's been happening all season so far after we left Adelaide. Since then, the tables have been turning everything in favour of Marcus Ambrose. Bit of debris on turn four there. Somebody's left behind. The bigger picture starts to come into play. Mark Scaife, untouchable last season. Unflappable, rarely made a mistake throughout the entire championship and obviously blitzed him. Now some mistakes are starting to creep in. Here's Jason Bright, the championship leader for 2003, yet to win a race for a round. Go, 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 go. 911 championship points, so consistent. That's the kind of stuff that'll win you the title in 2003, given the points series. And here's the guy who's second overall on the ladder with 882 points. Rusty? Good stop by both Team Brock and Kmart. They won't get out ahead of Marcus or ahead of Mark Scape, but 7.4 was the time from, uh, from Team Brock. Interestingly, though, Stephen Richards has leapfrogged Paul Radisic in the pits. It's shaking out now as they unfold this stop, and there's uh, the gap between the leaders and Ambrose. Now, with tyre pressures and temperatures normalised, has got a couple of car lengths margin over Mark Scape. Fastest man on the track with Rodney Ford's on the, the outfield. The exit of turn four. Mark Scapes recorded a one minute nine point one. Did that on lap six, as you can see from the graphic. Jason Bright, when he was at Stone Brothers Racing, obviously in the Ford in 1999, he gave SBR their first championship round win here at Hidden Valley. That's Mark Noski going off-road. Typical time loss at a pit stop here. It's about 45 seconds from uh, your departure from your norm, normal uh, lap speed time profile to where you rejoin your normal uh, lap speed time profile. The really good stops last year were in the high 30s, but on average it was about 44, 45. It's Mark Noski looping the AU Falcon around at turn one. A lot of fires in this area over the course of the weekend, Matthew, because of the amount of flame that spits from the exhausts, which are often turned down at the exhaust uh, tip end uh, in order to reduce noise. And uh, we had a lot of incidents where practice and qualifying was actually uh, was halted with a red flag, according to the, uh, the fire marshals. Well, about six or seven spot fires, if you like, throughout the qualifying sessions, but they've been up there with whippersnippers, a little bit of back burning, hopefully no interruptions today. We are on lap eight of 35 at the valley. By the way, if you're doing a little bit of a form guide, since we've been here in 98, went this way, Holden, Ford, Holden, Ford, Holden, who will stand on top of the podium at the end of the day. Lap 9 of 35, we'll take a break from the top end, come back shortly. It's a resumption of play in the heavyweight battle of the V8 Supercar Championship. The blue corner, Marcus Ambrose in the red, Mark Scape. On corrected positions, these guys are one and two in the race. Three cars in front of them, yet to pit. Dean Canto, Craig Baird, and Stephen Ellery. So from fourth onwards, you've got the guys who have pitted. Murphy there in seventh. Corrected, that puts him fourth. Ooh, Scape locked the brake on the way into five then. There's a bit of aggravation. Locked rear brakes for Russell Ingle on the way into turn one as he tried to go underneath Anthony Tratt. Made a mistake. Greg Ritter went with him. So it's not been a good weekend for Russell Ingle. Here's the replay. And it was as a result of being on the dirty side of the racetrack. And then right at the very end of the stop when the uh, temperature grows in the rear brakes, they've locked up and off he's gone. And you can imagine the words. Help. And here's a replay of Greg Ritter again. And this time it's uh, Dumbrell on the outside just trying to take uh, avoiding action there. Now, Scaife was really getting close to the back of Ambrose in the last couple of laps, and in particular under brakes, but that little mistake up in the valley has cost him a little bit there. What he can't afford to do is to just drive the car outside the box, put a little flat spot on a tyre, or just take himself off the road ever so slightly, because 
even though he'll be trying to knuckle down at the moment, he will be frustrated about the fact that he gave track position back to Marcus after such a ripper start. Get your thoughts on this part of the circuit exactly. They come out of turn five, they go through this kind of weird little kink that is turn six, seven, and then a lot of violent bumps well, on the road. There's some bumps, there's a surface change and an unusual corner radius, and then the same when you come up here to turn eight. There are bumps on the approach, and eight, nine, ten, very unusual in the way they're shaped. Turn 10, the one that marks out at the moment. Uh, and they've shifted the tyres closer to the apex for this year in order to change the radius and the way in which the guys exit the corner. But very unusual corner. Very easy to lock up an unweighted front tyre up on the top part of the circuit and leave a nasty flat spot on there. 270 kilometre an hour approach to turn one. It's a 3.5 dip and on the good laps they're right on the 7,500 RPM rev limit. A lot of lock required to get through one. is actually using second gear down there. All the way up to fifth. There's the bump. A little kick back in the steering wheel on the way to turn four. Actually, let's just go quiet for a moment and have a listen to the HRT car at full tilt. Stephen Ellery is the only one yet to pit. When he does so, we'll have a fully corrected race order. And Ambrose pulls away on car seven. Mark Scaife is now stuck behind Rodney Forbes as they go up from three and four. Cleanly underneath him. It's only tiny, but at the top of the show, we mentioned the fact that these guys are measuring their difference in performance in the in the order of tiny fractions. It's, uh, it's got down to such a narrow margin. So every little element of the car is critical in the setup. Let's get an update from Pit Lane. Rusty, Greg. Matty, just uh, observing a couple of stops earlier on and how crucial it is to have a nice, slick stop and how valuable it can be to you in terms of track position. David Bernard came in behind Mark Larkham. Larkham had a problem with the left front. The crew took 13 seconds to do that stop, but in the process, Bernard leapfrogged him. And also, too, a bit of radio chat between Kim Jones and his brother Brad. It sounds though like car 21, the Aussie male Ford, has a damaged or broken header right now. Paul Radisic was definitely one of the losers out of those pit stops as well. He lost about five positions. The trouble was a jam rear right-hand wheel nut. And I notice now HRT have a left front wheel out for Todd Kelly, so possibly a flat spot there. Stephen Johnson is another who has yet to pit. Remember, he did have to come in, but it was before the pit window opened. Here's Todd Kelly coming back in. It'll be interesting to see what as Todd Kelly has. Darrell might be able to understand that. The suggestion from the Greek was the flat spot. Yeah. It's not showing on our timing monitor at the moment. Darrell. The team just pulled that, yeah, it's got a big flat spot on the bottom of the tyre, really big right through the uh, carcass, Neil, so it's, uh, it's a good one. Yeah, you can't afford to uh, press on with that and try and uh, get away with it. It's obviously very dangerous. Greg Murphy found himself at the eye of the storm again yesterday. 20 laps to go. And he's currently in fifth position. One minute 9.4 has been his fastest lap. It was a 10 flat on that last lap. And he's trying to hunt down Jason Bright in the VX Commodore. Murph's coming off his best round of the season as we take a look at Garth Tander's approach to turn one. Greg Murphy left WA with a smile on his dial, second overall and a race win. It bumped him three places up the championship. So he's now fourth on the ladder. Garth Tander, sort of out there on his own at the moment. He's in fifth position corrected. He's coming off a fifth placing as well, WA. Two-time runner-up on this circuit in 1999 and 2000. They've had their trouble since then at Gary Rogers Motorsport. 
Jamie Wincup into the fray. One of the youngsters out there will have a word to say or two about Dean Canto as well, who's really under the pump here. He's effectively been put on notice by Briggs Motorsport that he's got to perform here. Otherwise, he may be looking for another drive somewhere. And you'll see him down the order. Car number 66 in 16th position. 30 seconds back. He finished race one, 18th, Dean Canto. Yep. First round here at Hidden Valley. So Stephen Ellery comes in. He was actually leading the race and now taking the stop late. Drop him a long way down the order. The second four, he'll drop the best part of 40 odd seconds to go through this process. Slot him back in the field a fair way down the order. This is the brand new car driven by Stephen Richards. I said earlier that uh, he got off to a strong start early in the weekend. He was fourth quickest in the first practice Friday afternoon, third fastest in the second practice session on Saturday morning. But then come qualifying time, they put brand new tyres on it, expected it to go like a blur, and ended up 16th. So it didn't respond to new tyres at all. Expected to see a time in the mid eights out of the car and, and discovered that it really needed to alter the setup in order to get the car. Ooh, got a lot of room on the exit there for Stephen with Jason Richards out wide. And, um, but he's just gradually been clawing back ground since that point in time. And that's really been the characteristic of his championship this year, Matthew, has just been consistent. This man here, Simon Wills, was really quick in the warm-up this morning. He was fourth fastest, and uh, they found a gain overnight, just raking through data, and they made a change to the car this morning, and it worked, and they were making another little change just prior to the car going out, literally only minutes before it went onto the grid. Look at that set of numbers there. Air temp, 32, track temp, 37, and the average cabin temperature at the moment is 45 fairly hot day in the office. One of the big movers out there is Max Wilson, up 13 positions, Glenn Seaton. Oh, oh, and David Bernard, a chain reaction. At the front of that is Craig Baird, wide as Ellery. Yeah, and Ellery, for some reason, had a problem going in there and kind of backed it up, and that meant that Baird had to get on the brakes, and then uh, Glenn had nowhere to go. It was kind of uh, it was a Friday afternoon traffic accident, wasn't it? Peak hour. Here's Paul Radisic. What a great performance. He's really chipping away. You were mentioning just before there, Stephen Richards really chipping away. This guy has been averaging in qualifying 24th position, but in terms of rounds, he's averaging 10th position. And it's no wonder that he's beginning a climb up the championship ladder. He's now up to eighth after race one yesterday. Let's get down to Rusty and see what's happening with Mark Larkin, Greg. Well, Matty, the Orcon Ford has come in. They're a bit puzzled, the team. They don't know whether it's a, a plug lead problem, but it's, a, it's developed a miss of some sort, and he's struggling to get out pit lane here. Hasn't been a good weekend for those guys. They ended up having to start rear of grid with both cars for the first race yesterday afternoon after an infringement with the engine control units or the ECUs in that car, or those cars, I should say. And so their qualifying times were stripped start up the back and Darrell what can you tell us about the Todd Kelly tyre situation well obviously uh, now you can see where it's worn right through here in the belt as well but I just spoke to the boys from Dunlop and they said the track temperature now is on the rise it's risen five degrees since the start of the race it's now up to 42 degrees and these tyres you can feel the temperature how hot it is you can barely touch it are running about 85 right now it's not a flat spot it's a crocodile bite <laughs> you'll probably get one. He's down in 30th position at the moment, Todd Kelly, so right back, and it's kind of been that, that kind of year for him as well. No results at Eastern Creek or Winton. He is 13th in the championship. There's a big fire going on in the distance there. Marcus Ambrose is our race leader. One and a half seconds clear of Mark Scape at the moment, and Jason Bright, so it's kind of business as usual at the front of the grid. Yeah, it's a hot one. Can Stone Brothers Racing continue to hold on to this awesome record that they've got at the Valley? They've had so much good fortune here throughout different drivers. And at the moment, Marcus Ambrose has them on target for more success. Back after this. We're back at the Valley, and that part of the circuit, by the way, is literally the Valley. In turn five, Jason Bright versus Greg Murphy in this battle on the road for third and fourth position. And Bright is effectively the valley man of this series. Had his maiden championship win here in 99, 
four starts for a round win and two second placings. Two pole positions and two race wins. At the moment, he's got a handful of Greg Murphy. A lot of garbage on the windscreen there on Murphy's car, which is interesting. I don't know where he would have picked all that up, but uh, it looked pretty grotty, little streaks all over it. So either someone's uh, flicked a bit of water or oil out somewhere. Incidentally, Lowndes has come in and taken his compulsory stop, and that was his second stop because they black flagged him when the bumper was hanging off that car earlier. So uh, he's languishing down at the bottom of the order at the moment. Last lap for both these two guys, 10-6 and 10-7 respectively. So real intense, but no one can lay a glove on Ambrose and Scaife for pace at the moment. They're a good two or three tenths, if not more, quicker on average per lap compared to everybody else. Murphy sort of thought about it then, but just didn't really have track position wasn't far enough up the inside and it's a bit of diminishing return there because uh, the bump upsets the car sufficiently on the approach to four and the dirty side of the road doesn't do you any favours so if you do actually get too adventurous there you're more likely to meet with Mr B pillar than you are with uh, making a good clean pass. So Stephen Johnson now comes in this will be for his compulsory tyre stop. Remember, he had to come in just before the window opened for the damage. Yeah. And with the pit window closing at the end of 24, he's run out of time. In these relatively short races, Matthew, once you've been into that pit lane twice, it's game, set, match. Yeah. Um, you just don't recover from it, unfortunately. So there was a, a puncture or some sort of damage on the left rear of Stephen's car, probably as a result of that stuff that happened at Turn 5 in the opening lap and it's put him out of business. Murphy continues to just hammer the back of Bright, and that's actually inviting Garth Tander to the party at the moment. He's getting closer and closer all the time. Oh, again, Murphy having a look. Oh, he's giving him a little touch-up as well. And he's flicked the lights on. You can see the reflection of the headlights in the rear of the number 50 car. Boys are all just <laughs> starting to wind the preload up on each other here. You had that snigger then. You know exactly what's going to happen if it oh. keeps going that way, don't you? Well, what it is, it's like a little delivery of your business card. It's like, hello, this is who I am and this is where I am, in case you've forgotten. And then um, if you've got that little bit of extra pace, you can, uh, you can keep rattling away a bit on the back of the other guy. Rusty? Well, you talk about guys being taken out of the game by dramas in pit lane. I can't quite figure out why yet. I'm having a look at the tyres that have just come off Jason Richard's car, but he has had two stops in this one for tyres. Yeah, well, he um, he also was involved in that turn five thing on the opening lap, and I wouldn't mind betting because he lunged up the inside that he flat spotted a front left on the way in there and that brought him in. I'd be curious to know how Todd Kelly put such a monster on his car because that was probably, I imagine, looking at the size of it going into the turn one breaking area. This is a great bit of road through here, Matthew. Turns two and three. B wallop in the road there but the car speed on the way in is fantastic it's a really exciting ride about 215 k's 90 odd k's through turn four back up to 160 k's here before you break it oh tander up the inside he's done it murph was thinking about Brighty, and then he left the gap hugely wide for tander who just went straight down the inside and nailed him and did it there was contact but he was well up the inside and I don't think Murphy realised that he was as close or, or he was as vulnerable as, in fact, he was. Caught napping Greg Murphy and Garth Tander took advantage with a big don't argue. Craig Lowndes has looped on the rear of that. He's, He's out. out of play. Yes. He's 30th, in fact, at the moment. But uh, what about the instant fight back from Greg Murphy as soon as he saw Tander? Watch this. So these two go in there. Tander comes in and says, forget about him. I'm coming through. Yeah, I don't reckon Greg thought that... Garth was as close as he was and he just left it wide open for him and uh, what's Kiwi for Darnit? <laughs> Ambrose leads, Scaife is second, Bright is third, Garth Tander now is fourth and Greg Murphy shuffles back to fifth. Stephen Richards appears to be a long way back on that shot that we just had there, he's sixth between him on the road, as we mentioned, is a back marker in Craig Lowndes. Tanda fourth in race one. He's been averaging 11th overall for each round in the series, and that's exactly where he is on the championship ladder. Here's the gap, first to second. It's now out to 1.6 seconds, so it's looking as though Marcus has got this one bagged up mistakes notwithstanding and they're coming up onto the back of Todd Kelly and Rodney Forbes again wasn't 
those last two laps. You can see there in the right hand of the uh, side of the screen, lap 24 and 25 shows that Scafer's a tenth of a second better than Ambrose. May have been a, as a result of some back market traffic. Look at this freight train. This is uh, Ingle in here, Cito's in there as well, 18 and 19, there's a whole bunch of them, but some of them are out of position as well, which confuses the order a bit. Stephen Richards is in sixth position. Paul Dumbrell is in 25th position. Their team boss, Larry Perkins, is with Darrell Beatty. Darryl. Larry, difficult qualifying session, you could say, for the new car, but how's uh, sixth position so far? Well, you know, it's the same old story, isn't it? Um, you can't ever go as fast as you want it to, and um, uh, Stephen didn't get the qualifying time that he would have liked, but uh, he's recovered really well from his 17th spot. He's now running sixth, so I'm very happy with that, and he's keeping his nose clean. But, you know, it's still a few laps to go, and, uh, you know, we, we've just got to live with, live with the speed we've got and get on with it. Are you able, do you think, to make, make ch many changes between races? Well, we were disappointed to uh, not be as fast as we wanted. The car didn't go as fast as it should have on the uh, new tyres. But, look, that's things that we've got to deal with. Uh, you know, the main thing is he's still pressed on and uh, he's getting up the you know, right end. As I say, he's up the sixth from a disastrous practice time and uh, one more race to go. But, look, um, it's still only one round in, another, in a long championship. Paul's back in 24th. He's had a few dramas during the race. Paul Dumbrell. Well, yeah, Paul has been unfortunately caught um, in other people's problems and uh, so he hasn't done anything wrong himself except it has put him back a few more spots than he should have uh, been. But look, it's, it's not the end of the world. When you're past 15 to 20, it doesn't really matter. You just got to keep your nose clean. Thanks, Larry. And after yesterday's race, the championship standings have Stephen Richards second with 882 points. Jason Bright still championship leader with 911. So... As Larry suggested, keeping your nose clean and just lurking around there in sixth position is actually a handy thing for Stephen Richards because the way the points weighting has been done this year, that still puts him totally in touch with where he wants to be in the championship. Meanwhile, Garth Tander, folks, has actually got by as Anthony Trapp plucks his helmet off and Tander's got by Bright. Oh, look at Ingle, got the rear brakes all locked here. This could end in tears. Max Wilson is not an easy guy to pass at the best of times. He's a fierce little racer and he's got himself... Well covered in here. Bernard's thumping into the back of Ingle as well as they go into turn five. This is a battle for 18th and 19th. They had a lot of damage on the Ingle car last night. They actually finished at 11 o'clock though, so relative to late night motor racing disasters, it wasn't too bad, but the, uh, the damage for them was the fact that they lost those four race tyres before they'd even negotiated the first corner. Only ten tyres allocated this weekend, so two and a half sets. And uh, Matthew, you've got a balance sheet, I noticed there. You're, you're doing some part-time accounting, are you? Well, it all sounds very good, but, gee, if you're the team boss at Stone Brothers Racing, it's really ugly. This is what's been spent on repairs for Russell's car since, since the start of 2003. And trouble for Mark Larkham again. Time and again, he's found himself in trouble at turn one. He was caught wide. Look at the flame coming out there. And now you know why so many grass fires, but they've chopped all that back down. So Larkin spears off again. Just got some numbers. I'll race through them quickly. Adelaide, 40 grand. Phillip Island, 50 grand. Eastern Creek, 15. Perth, 20 grand. Darwin, 15,000 man hours at around 100 grand. That's a grand total of around 240,000 bucks worth of repair jobs on the car that we're sitting in currently. Russell would have shouted him. Yeah. He just would have dipped into that extensive bank account. Gee, I have uh, Ross and Jimmy Stone weren't listening to that quarter of a million gone, but Russell Ingle, the enforcer, is fighting. We know that for sure. He'll never give up, and he continues to tap the Brazilian Max Wilson in the rear on lap 29. Oh, it's 35. We'll take a break. It appears as though Marcus Ambrose has got this wrapped up. Come back and join us after this in the Valley. Welcome back. The BA brawl between Ingle and Wilson is now officially over, and Russell Ingle has taken the points. But Jamie Wincup has found the dirt and maybe the tyre wall. It's on the exit of turn eight. Uh, awkward spot to go in there, but... Uh... Don't go too far back, Jay. Yeah. Awkward spot to get out of, too. John Bow had a couple of good trips throughout there in 2002. Oh, he's just got in there too hot, got over the ripple strip. Oh. 
Ooh. I don't know. He clouded the issue for us. Now, this is what happened with Ingle. Remember when we left you? They were tapping on each other's doors, and Ingle just did the big switch back and got him. That only happened just as we came back. Well, Max drove so f defensively, he drove right down the inside and just made his corner speed. His mid corner speed was appalling to slow, and then Bezzy gets him as well. And I think Craig Baird buys into it. So uh, Max just actually, he triggered that himself by being so shallow on the way in before. It just made him so slow through there. And then the angry pack have just eaten him alive. Safety car is going to be deployed. The yellow flag is out. So there must be an issue. Uh, there's four laps to go, Russell. Four to go. Somewhere around the circuit that the race director is uncomfortable with. Order at the moment, Ambrose, Scaife, Tander, Bright, Murphy. And is this... Still Jamie, Jamie trying here, to come or? back, so he obviously did collect the tyre wall in the end of all that. Yeah. Big time, she's got uh, about 45 degrees of camber on the front right. Safety car's out. Jamie Wincup's doing his level best to get it back into pit lane. Wonder and why. that will mean that we're going to have about a four lap dash. Look at this. Oh. That's a sick and sorry beast. It's not going where he wants it to go because he wants to go the exact opposite way. Oh, The 20-year-old Victorian in his first V8 supercar season, making his Darwin debut here. And with his teammate Garth Tander, they've deployed the new cool suit for this round to keep the temperature down. So the safety car is letting the field go past to pick up the leader. And there it is, Marcus Ambrose. It looked as though he did it on his own as well. Uh, I'm a bit puzzled as to why we've got a safety car at this point. Greg. I'm down here with Gary Rogers, Neil. You're doing a few Hail Marys before the start of the race, but the bloke upstairs hasn't been too kind here. Uh, I believe in that big fella upstairs. <laughs> He's helped us a lot. What happened as far as Jamie's concerned? Have you spoken to him on the radio? I haven't spoken to him. He just got on the radio and said there was no steering, but I'd say that happened when he hit the bank. I think he's just had a lose. He's young, he's impetuous, he's having a bit of a go. And you hate it, but it's going to happen from time to time. Quickly, the weekend didn't start too well for Garth, but going exceptionally well at the moment. We've been working hard on the new car, and, I mean, you know, it's just disappointing when you put the time and the result doesn't come. But, look, we're heading in the right direction. I'm sure we'll get back where we were. Cheers, Gary. Thanks, Greg. So, Gary Sorry. Rogers and uh, Jamie Winkup have a sit-down chat about what happened there. Winkup is out of the race. His best performance of the year in his first year came in his first round, 22nd at Adelaide for the Formula 4 champ for last year. Um, I'm assuming that this um, safety car has been uh, deployed because of car 33, but it was deployed before 33 even came to its resting position. So, unless there was some other issue on that around the track somewhere but uh, Marcus Ambrose I can tell you is none too impressed he's uh, exploded on the radio because he had a very very healthy margin which uh, has all been evaporated now I have had it confirmed that uh, safety car has been deployed just for car number 33 so it's a little bit of a strange one that one at the end of all that like I said we're headed for another three or four lap dash Greg Ross. Rusty, are you with us? Just having spoken to a few of the team managers, Matthew, it does seem as though it's only the Wing Cup uh, incident that has brought out this safety car. Now, another issue which is raised in drivers' briefings, team managers' briefings, etc., in the build-up to this event is restarts from a safety car because we have such a long straight here at Hidden Valley. Very important not to overlap or overtake a car until you get to that start-finish line. We have seen dramas before. Daryl's just been having a chat to Ross Stone. What do you got, Daryl? Yeah, I just spoke to Ross. I said it was it just stopped because of wind cup. He said no. Apparently there was a tire on the side of the track from that that shunt when he hit the wall. Okay. Well, it's all in this man's hands. Marcus Ambrose, as Jamie Wincup surveys the damage. Gary Rogers got a huge rap on this guy. I mentioned he's only young, 20 years old. I've already raised the point that. Another 20-year-old in the field, or 22-year-old Dean Cando under pressure. Paul Dumbrell still trying to find his feet. It's a big game and it's a tough one. Sorry, Matthew, I just um, was uh, away from the game here for a minute. But I think I've just had it confirmed, you may have mentioned this, that there was a tyre on the yeah. circuit. Yeah, Daryl so. uh, had okay. that confirmed by Ross Stone. So that was uh, the issue there. Mark Scaife. 
Don't forget tonight we've got Formula One folks. It's going to be a late night, but the European Grand Prix from the Nürburgring will be on Network 10 Motorsport after the movie. And Kimi Raikkonen has pole position, his first ever pole position. And it's astonishingly close. There's just three drivers separated by one tenth of a second. There they are, pole to Kimi, Michael Schumacher alongside him, Ralph Schumacher. So a great mix of chassis and engines and tyres. Montoya is fourth, Barrichello fifth, Yano Trulli is sixth, Olivier Pan is seventh. He was actually fastest for two of the sessions so far up at the European Grand Prix. And so Toyota are well in the game after some extensive testing in the last couple of weeks. And there's Jeff Grick. Just taking a look at what's going on. Jim Stone from Stone Brothers Racing. This is going to be a frantic blast at the end. Greg? Well, I'm back with Gary Rogers. You're a little concerned that this may finish under safety car. Well, I think it probably will, Greg. And I mean, it's a shame. You know, would the people come to see a spectacle and a race really needs to be that. There's safety issues. I personally think our car could be left where it is, but even if they take it off the track, there should be a rule where you have to race minimum maybe five clear laps to the flag on a circuit this size. NASCAR's got the rule. It's a sensible rule. It's good for the crowd. It's good for the TV, and, and in particular, good for the sponsors to spend their money. Thanks, Gary. Kim Jones also prowling. Look at the team managers. They're all wearing a very concerned look. So this is the problem. Jamie Winkup's car is parked down the main straight. But yeah, it's, uh, you can see the, that's the rear of the grid. He wanted to go right and dip into pit lane, but yeah, he couldn't get in there without pit the steering. Pit lane entry is there on the right-hand side, but he couldn't get in there because of the lack of steering control, so he's had to come across to the dead side of the track. Now, assuming that they do get a restart underway, on the road, Ambrose, and then Todd Kelly is behind him and in front of Mark Scaife. So, on the radio chat that we've been listening to, we understand that Toddler has been informed by the bosses let Mark through. He's in a better race position. Maybe Jeff Gregg can expand on that with Daryl. Jeff, they haven't got that car off just yet, and there's a possibility it could finish under the uh, safety car. What, what do you think of that rule? Well, um, I'm surprised that it's on the truck now. I mean, I, for the sake of all the fans, um, not that the positions had probably changed, but it'd be nice to have at least a one-lap uh, sprint at the end. But you know, I mean, I'm not the I'm not the judge of fact, but certainly it's, it'll be. No, their lights are out. I'm just hearing. So she's on. <laughs> Thanks, mate. She's on. All right, one lap. A race to the end. It's um, that particular spot in the road. Um, the, the, a race car would never go over there. So I tend to agree with Gary. I don't think it was really at any point oh, in time. Oh, jeez. Take a look at this. That is farcical. They were going to come round and do a one-lap dash. That's all a bit silly. Further back in that field, the midfield has had to stop at turn 10. Well, everybody's had to stop, but now they've had to me. rev it up again, so it is on. One lap, one to go. Well, Todd Kelly pulls aside and lets Scape go through. Marcus Ambrose has got a lot of distance between him and the next red car. A 2.9 kilometre circuit. I tell you race what, race is what it's come down to. They'll be taking tickets at race control for this one because there'll be a queue of every team manager in the place there. There'll be 20 blokes marching down there after this race. That is a joke way to start a motor race. Not to mention finish one, Neil. Marcus Ambrose through turn four. The order is Ambrose, Scaife, Tander, Bright, Greg Murphy. That makes up your top five. Todd Kelly's in that picture there, but he's out of the game. These guys caught up as back markers. It appears as though the battle is back on between Jason Bright and Greg Murphy. Gee, there'd be some unhappy people with that because uh, what you saw in the background of that shot, and this race is just going to stay as it is now in these uh, top spots, but there were people that were sort of spread eagled and stopped at the top of the circuit. You know, literally, and the rule is that you've got to go down to the start line yep. single file, so people have had to duck left and right. Anyway, whatever the result, you get them any way you can. and. After two races here at Hidden Valley, it's all square. Marcus Ambrose and Mark Scaife are tied. Thanks, guys. Fantastic job. In race wins. Really good, mate. Uh, make good progress there. And in championship points. 126 points each now for Ambrose and Scaife. And Scaife finishes second after winning race one yesterday. And Garth Tanner gets himself into third position. It was a good one for Marcus Ambrose. He made the move when Scaife made a little bit of an error.
coming around turn 10 early on in the race, but when it all came down to it at the very end, oh geez, it was a fizzer. Still, as I mentioned, you get him any way you can. Ambrose wins. Skate second. Tander third. Two Fords in the top eight. The rest of the General's men. Another good performance from Paul Radisich. Simon Wills and John Bauer hold on to their top ten positions. Paul Wheel has been consistent throughout the year. One race to go. Can he push himself further up into a top ten finish? 35 laps to go. Another 100 kilometres. We'll come back after this and decipher all that. And see who's angry, who's not. But Marcus Ambrose is happy. He's got the race win under his belt. Back after this with Paul. This is another Snickers satisfying moment. And Mark Scaife will go back to back at Bathurst. My most satisfying moment in the Bear Supercar would be Bathurst. Uh, in 2002, it was just an extraordinary race. Well, look at Scaife, takes aim straight away at the restart. That race, as Australia's biggest race, with my, my mate from 10 years ago as Jim Richards, it was just uh, it was, it was an unbelievable day. Mark Scaife! and certainly uh, to do that together was, 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 was unbelievable. It was a funny race because uh, there, was, uh, there was a lot of guys in contention to win and uh, we actually ended up being able to pass his son you know, quite late in the race, which probably for the Richards family was a bit of a, a, bit of a difficult one, but you know, for Jimmy and I to win that race uh, together again, it's just you know, one of those things that you, know, you, you can't explain. That was another Snickers satisfying moment. A fair bit has changed since that satisfying moment for Mark Scape. Now the man most satisfied for obvious reasons is Marcus Ambrose. Let's recap the finishing order from race two. Ambrose first, Scape second, Garth Tander third. Bright and Greg Murphy rounding out the top five. The guys that we've highlighted, Dean Canto moved up from 18th to 12th. Russell Ingall started at the rear of the grid at 33rd and finished 17th. And poor old Stephen Johnson went backwards from 13th down to 29th. It was a controversial race, but a good one for Garth Tander. That's his best race finish of the year. He's with Daryl Beattie. Garth, good drive. You uh, had a good battle with Murph there at the end as well. Yeah, the car was looking after his tyres really well. We uh, probably stayed out two or three laps too long at the start and lost a lot of track position, but sort of got out on the good tyres and just put in a couple of quick laps and I managed to catch Bridey and Murph and then uh, slip through on the both of them. But uh, an interesting race. Uh, the, the last lap was uh, pretty full on. We had to tow trucks and yellow flags and all sorts of gear going on. So, uh, yeah, interesting. What did you think of that restart? Too quick? Oh, it was ridiculous. There was a truck on the... We had to swerve around a truck that was on the track. There were still yellow flags at the starters box, yellow flags all the way through turn one. Um, you know, it's just ridiculous. Got any changes for the car for the next race? Yeah, we still like to make it a little bit better, so we'll, we'll change a few small things, but uh, generally the package is pretty good. Uh, we just get a good start, put the right strategy together, and hopefully run with the front two. Thanks, Garth. Thanks, mate. So after two races, there are two men tied on points for the overall championship round. Mark Scape, the winner of race one. Marcus Ambrose, the winner of race two. And as we said, the 26-year-old devil racer has history on his mind. He's with Greg Rust. Matty, we've briefly escaped the uh, searing Darwin heat. We're here in the uh, Stone Brothers racing truck. Bit of a history lesson. 1977, Ford won four rounds in a row. That was Alan Moffat. It's been a long time since that happened. Potentially, you could do it today. Do you think about that? Yeah, it's very much on my, on my mind right now. I've really got to focus on, on trying to get a good start this next race. And if we can get four out of four, it'd be great for Ford and, and for me personally too, because, you know, it's probably the first big record that I've achieved. Um, you look at Mark Scape as well, and he got five in a row last year, so that's probably the goal that I'm really looking for. You were only a little tacker when Alan Moffat achieved that one year old. What, what are the career ambitions for you? I mean, would you like to emulate the greats? Where is Marcus Ambrose going, big picture? Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm pretty confident that, that I've committed myself to five years down here um, to make sure that I'm, I'm giving my best shot to win the championship and I'm really happy with the Stones. Um, my first year in V8s was a boom or bust. I really wanted to make an impression and see if I could make a career out of the sport. 
that's happened and we've now progressed to a level where we can really settle down and, 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 uh, and be responsible on the track and really try to put a championship run together. So the next five years, guaranteed, I'll be down here giving it my best shot. But I've always said to Ross Stone and, and the guys around me, if the enjoyment stops, um, I'll stop. And uh, it's, there's a lot of sacrifice to go motor racing at the top level. You've got to really be very committed and, and uh, sacrifice a lot of things. And, and really, you know, for that sacrifice, you've got to love what you're doing. And I do. But, you know, if the demands and pressures and things get too much and the enjoyment goes, then I'll probably have a sabbatical for a while. Well, let's talk more about that pressure then, because there's a lot of corporate pressure from Ford's point of view. How much does Ford want this, this four-round wins, and, and what sort of effect does that have on you? Yeah, there is pressure there, definitely, and, and from every angle, from SBR, from Pertec, from, from all the people that are invested in, in this motorsport program. Um, you've got to deliver, it, and it takes a, a huge commitment, like I said. And, uh, you know, if the enjoyment goes away and the passion goes away, you can't get the results. And so, if it, you know, I don't want to go out on, on, a, on a losing streak, you know. I want to go out doing the best job I possibly can. Um, and that's it, you know. Um, as a professional driver, there are lots of pressures from every angle and you've got to absorb those. And, and really, self-control is a very difficult thing and, and you've got to be very self-controlled in this game, not just on the track, but off the track too. That's how you seem to, I guess, deal with the, the pressure and the controversy at times that happens in motor racing. The points are deadlocked coming into this, this final race between you and Mark Scaife. What have you got to do to win the round? <laughs> uh, you've got to be really calm and uh, focus on your starts and the pit stops and, and try and keep Mark under pressure. If, if uh, We're pretty much toe for toe and uh, the last race was really tough, you know, it was a real dogfight there for a long time, very equal in speed. So, you know, the smartest guy is going to win, I think, and, and Mark's a, a, a great competitor. I just really enjoyed racing with Mark because we're clean, but we're aggressive and we're really on the edge the whole time. And, and basically, it's going to be the, the smartest guy and the bravest guy and, and great pit work too, you know, let's not forget about the crew. Good luck. Thank you. Well, there was a recurring theme there in that interview, and it was the word pressure. It really started to build for Marcus Ambrose at the end of 2002 when he won the last round. He's carried that form through, obviously, into this year, and maybe the pressure is starting to show on Mark Scaife because one mistake is all it takes. Mark, you got away to the, the perfect start, and you have a little slip-up where Marcus got you early in the race? Yeah, I missed a gear, down a bloody dickhead. Just uh, come onto the straight, and no normally it's quite a short change. Yeah. Second to third gear change. I just balked it. I just balked it first, and by the time I got third, it was over. So very average performance. So difficult though, you know, there's nothing in these cars at the moment and something like that can just lose you the race. Yeah, look, I think if we we're in the lead, you know, you don't use your tyres as hard when you're in the lead, so I think if you're in the lead, you probably have the opposite result, but, uh, and as we showed yesterday, I mean, the car was very good, so, uh, uh, you know, I mean, we just got to get ourselves organised. We changed a couple of little things then, probably hurt a little bit, so we'll, uh, we'll change it back. All the best for the next one. Thanks, mate. All right, so the scene is this. There is one more race to go. 35 laps, 100 kilometres. Scaife is going for his first round win in five rounds. Marcus Ambrose is going for four straight championship victories. We'll be gridding up right after the break here at Hidden Valley on your home of motorsport, Network Two. teams in particular that come from the southern states head up to Darwin and race at Hidden Valley is temperature. Now you don't really even need to look at the forecast, it's always going to be 30 or more degrees here in terms of air temperature. And we know as a general rule of thumb that inside the cabin it's at least another 20 degrees hotter. So when you're talking about a 50 degree cockpit temperature in these race cars, it's very uncomfortable. Now various teams have come up with various solutions to keep their drivers cool. There are cool suits, ventilated helmets. Here at Aussie Mail Racing they've gone for a fairly simple solution to stick the driver's helmet in the fridge. Now when Bradley or John stick their helmets on initially, they feel fantastic. It only lasts for a couple of laps in terms of benefit, but at least they feel good and every little bit counts. do anything to keep cool, won't they? Those donuts look pretty good in there. I'd hate to see Bradley Jones get a donut mixed up for his helmet. <laughs> There's a look. Marcus Ambrose will start from pole position for the third and final race alongside Scape. 
What a battle. Garth Tander versus Jason Bright on the second row of the grid. Murphy and Richards, positions five and six. Rick Kelly and Paul Radisic, who continues to put in some good moves. I mentioned to you, Dean Canto, really under the pump. Looks as though he's answering back to his team boss, John Briggs, and Team Better Electrical. Jason Barguana is putting in a solid performance for Orcon Racing, while things don't really go to plan for his team boss, Mark Larkham and his teammate Glenn Seaton down there. Russell Engel will start from 17th on the grid. He made up eight positions in the first lap of race two, but then he threw them all away towards the end. Max Wilson involved in a fairly heavy dice mid-race. Jones, Dumbrell, Morris and Todd Kelly take us down to 24 from 25 through to 28. Well, look at that. Craig Lowndes is sandwiched all the way back in 27th position. You talk about luck. Nothing's gone his way. Jamie Wincup failed to finish in race two and Anthony Trapp will start from the very rear of the grid. Focus on Craig Lowndes. All trouble for Paul Morris. Greg Rust. Yeah, I can tell you, Matty, that uh, the team here have worked frantically in between the last race and this one. A full engine and gearbox change. Paul Sepernich at the front of the car directing Paul out now into pit lane, but he will start this one from the pits. All right, mate. Thank you. So that makes 32 on the grid. One in pit lane. And Paul Morris labours his way up to his starting position. As usual, there's a bit of hard work on between the heats as we look at Marcus Ambrose. Pretty happy with his car. And to some extent, uh, had one of the easiest passes he'll ever have to deal with, with uh, Scafie missing that gear. Garth Tander's car was... In his words, just perfect. He didn't touch anything, but they did change the gearbox. He said it was notchy going into fourth gear. I had a chat to both Mark Scaife and Marcus Ambrose just before we got this race underway. Said to you, said to both of them, tell me about your, your start plan. Marcus said to me, I'm calm. I don't do anything until the lights go. I don't focus on anything until I'm in second gear. Then I have a look around. Scaife said to me, it's frantic in there. Everything's going on. You want to make sure that you've got 100 out of 100 things right. You can just feel the tension inside the cockpit because there's no question that these two cars are matched for speed driver ability is pretty much neck and neck of course they've got the hunger they're tied on points 126 we've got a green flag that means in five seconds the lights will go out and the race will be on Ambrose and Scape at the front row of the grid. Tanda and Bright between them. It is neck and neck for the first 10, 20, 50 metres. Down to turn one. Crunch time. Ambrose is holding on. Scape is stuck out on the right. Bright goes really wide. And Ambrose shoots through. Tanda. Scape was held up high. He raced Ambrose all the way to the corner, but that became a perfect invitation for Garth Tander, who moves up a spot. Richards is up to fourth as well in car 11, and Kelly's been turned hard into the wall. That will be huge damage to the right-hand side of that car, very likely to prompt a safety car. Ripped a wheel off the car as well. Heavy contact for Kelly. We hope he's OK. Big jolt for Todd Kelly. He's OK. He's OK. Well, that was him onto the radio, back to the Holden Racing Team, and the marshals are straight there. Big, big, big impact. And a few gingerly steps for Todd Kelly. Seventh in race one, 24th in race two. And now a shake of the head. Mark Larkham also caught up in that drama. Yellow flags, safety car out onto the circuit. Have a look up the back of the pack here and what has happened you can't really actually it could be that Lowndes and kelly made contact but it's so difficult masked by so many cars this is the in, in car of the start the race to the first corner ambrose outbreaks scaife a little bit it puts scaife just high and wide it was enough for tander to come through the inside there he is a little kiss of the doors and then Richards tucks in behind there as well. It's a good start for him. It's going to take a little while for these cars to be cleaned up. This will put them in safety car limp mode for a little while while everybody settles down and has a think about it. This is the view from Mark Scaife's car. A little jolt of the car under the gear change. And then there's Marcus. Because he's on the inside line, he's just a bit better positioned at that critical point where they're applying the brakes. And there you see Tander go through the second. 
Ideally, Mark would have wanted to be further to the left to get the slightly cleaner track. And HRT, the uh, frustrated and concerned that uh, one of their cars has had a huge accident. Todd Kelly racing for Kmart was fourth overall last year at Hidden Valley. This time for HRT, he's going to slide considerably down the list. Put in his Ooh, look at that. second best qualifying performance of the year to be Look at that damage, here. Matthew, just that yeah. car there, the yeah. whole wheel hub assembly it's ripped suspension components out and on the other side of that car is where all the damage is there's uh, Paul Morris exiting the pit lane they may have taken the opportunity to continue to do more rectification work remember Paul started from the pit lane Greg well, Neil, I don't think the uh, the clutch settings were quite right. They came in. Paul was having difficulty selecting gears when he was trying to leave pit lane to begin with. They've come in, made a couple of adjustments very quickly and sent him straight back out. Hopefully it's cured. So, Rusty, that part of the circuit has uh, cost Todd Kelly his day. The other thing to focus on here, Matthew, is the pit window will open. You can pit under these conditions now, and I believe people will pit. You can see where they are. It was a little bit further on. In 2002, around about where Paul Morris is now, that Todd's brother Rick was caught up in a big time accident. 2002, seven cars involved in this. Take a look at this. Rick Kelly is just left there like a pinball. Paul Morris in there, David Bernard was in there, John Faulkner bounced around. Seven cars caught up in that a little bit further up the road. I think what you'll find here, interesting, uh You'd want to be careful making the decision to come leaping into the pit lane at the moment because there's big traffic jam potential and there's people certainly uh, were programmed to come in as soon as the window opened. The danger in this circumstance is you need to have a flexible plan. You need to be able to interact between team manager or crew tree, chief and driver, talk to each other and as you're cycling in, if there's 400 other blokes in the queue, it's the last place you want to be. This is where you can burn up five or ten extra seconds in that horrible pit lane shuffle. So That's what caught Russell Ingle out in uh, the second race. He said to me, gee, it was a good idea to come into pit lane when everybody else was in there. It just, like you say, completely and utterly put him behind the eight ball that he was already sitting behind. So Paul Morris, who started from pit lane, is back in there again. See, people are starting to roll up. They've got gear out. They're just quite incredible, these races. Don't really know what Paul Morris has just done. I don't think he stopped. He's just gone straight through there. Yeah. So he started from pit lane, Neil. He's got him out. There's been a big time accident well, on the that, first lap. What they're just trying to manage here is they don't want to go a, a lap down. So, and they might make some advantage in this circumstance, depending on what the issue is. Is they've obviously got, they've done a very quick installation of an engine and gearbox, and uh, that doesn't allow for finite adjustment. Look at this. That's a nightmare for some of these guys. Not the, not the first few, but when you're back in that pack there, this will turn into chaos. Let's have a look at, soak all this up. The boys are on the spot. This is Bedlam down here, guys. I can't begin to tell you, both Kmart cars have come in. They're all line of stern. Cameron McComble we're with at the moment. The Lansdale team have two green tyres up their sleeve, which they're going to stick down the right-hand side of Cameron McConville's car. What happened? He had a fire in the airbox during qualifying, got very little laps in, and they've saved some green tyres. But it is full on down here in pit lane at the moment. Well, what's happened? We've got Murphy has uh, come out a great beneficiary of that stop. Daryl? Yes, Neil, the one who lost out of that was Mark Scape. He got dropped off the Jackson with that new rule where they have to let the cars going through go first. He lost two spots. He got jumped by the looks of it by a couple of cars. And just to clarify that, for those that missed the earlier race, there's been a little bit of conjecture and confusion up and down the pit lane, really, about how to handle it. When the car controller releases a car that's been serviced, there is an onus on the car controller to make sure that he does it safely. The problem is we had some cars in Perth that were paralleling each other all the way down the lane. So the rule is, the interpretation that's being enforced from this weekend is that cars in the fast lane have right away. So if you've been released and you're about to depart your pit box, you must yield to the cars, in this case, on your left coming through. A quick head count coming out of pit lane. There was around about 23, 24 cars came in and used that opportunity. 
to pit under safety car conditions. We'll have a restart when we come back to the top end on your home of motorsport. They just look so menacing when they're out on the track, but almost one and a half tons of a mangled mess makes Todd Kelly's car just look like a toy car at the moment. It's heading back. HRT now has a one-man assault for this race. Understand the lights have gone out. Yes, they have on the safety car. There's only one man now who hasn't completed his pit stop while we're in the break. The other guys all started to dive in, but Dean Canto in car 66 has it. So he is the leader on the road, but corrected leaders are all lined up behind him. Marcus Ambrose, Greg Murphy was a big winner in that pit lane shuffle. He's now second, and he started fifth. Garth Tander was a bit of a loser. He dropped back down to uh, sixth position on corrected. And remember, he started third, and the dramas just continue for Paul Morris, who's making his 70th career start here this weekend. cycles through this compulsory pit stop he's going to be uh, absolutely at the tail of the train so pretty disastrous for him with the whole field corked up behind him so green flag we're racing again another restart over a kilometer long this main straight something went flying off a little bit of debris off to the uh, right hand side of the track oh, nervous energy so much of it taking around turn one the blue Scaife. chips on your PlayStation 2 race course show that they've all pitted except Canto. Scaife made a good move there and snuck up the inside. Oh, look at this. Murphy looking for space. Canto getting assaulted. An awkward spot here for Dean Canto. And Murphy decides, after what he learnt from the earlier race, not to have himself out hung wide there. So he dropped back in behind to make sure he covered the inside line. Remember, it was Tander that passed Murphy in that earlier race when Murphy was hanging out wide there. Garth Tan has done a bit of muscling in throughout the afternoon. Muscled in on Murphy in race two and muscled in on Mark Scaife at the start of race three. Look at the uh, gap that Ambrose is now making while everybody else is uh, freighted up there behind Canto. It's a perilous position to be in for Dean Canto. He's stuck right in the middle. Murphy positions to get to the inside, and I think he's made it stick, yes. So, so that releases Murphy, and it's Bright, and then Scaife. Then Tandon, then Richards, Simon Wills. There's Jason Barguana going through, Cameron McConville. Somebody going wide. Oh, that's one of the Kmart cars, so that'd be young Rick Kelly. And he, oh, looks big panel damage on one of the Orcon cars, and Rick joins his brother Todd as a spectator. At least he's got all four wheels on his car at the conclusion of that. And more aggravation here up at turn four. And this is Mark Noski, and I think it's Paul Wheel in the Team Brock car. I just wonder how much debris was left on the track when uh, Rick Kelly got tangled up in his incident. With something fairly substantial fell off one of the cars. A 111.2 on lap seven for Marcus Ambrose, but this will be, this will be the real run. one to have a crack at because he's got clean road. 9-9 nine, nine for Ambrose. He made two tenths on Murphy that lap, 10-1. Here comes Scaife looking at the inside of Bright. And as you pointed out quite correctly before there, Matthew, the Tander was the one that after starting from position three and getting a pretty reasonable start has uh, obviously dropped time in that pit stop. They're the adjusted points after race two. Jason Bright still leads the championships. Stephen Richards is still second. Marcus Ambrose is in third position. So not much of a change. It's quite extraordinary to think that the championship lead is being held by a man who's yet to win a race or around this season. Somebody crunched a few numbers and put last year's point system into play for this year and had Marcus Ambrose about 120 points ahead. But the point spread is much tighter for 2003. Big dip there as they come down to turn 10 as we take a look at Mark Scaife in position four. In front of him, his ex-teammate, Jason Bright. 
eight that time for Ambrose, so he's still enjoying margin. Ten flat for Murphy, ten flat for Bright, ten flat for Scaife. Just an extraordinary set of circumstances for all of these races. It just seems, even like the qualifying session, Neil, the first four or five laps, sometimes the first two laps, it's just a massive brain explosion out there. Everything happens, everyone goes crazy. There's offs, crashes, and they settle down after a few restarts. Barguana was the other car that was involved in that incident with Rick Kelly. And I thought I saw something substantial come off his car. It did. The right rear door is yeah. completely missing. Wow. I don't know that that's in the homologated aero package. <laughs> Might be an improvement for the AU. It'd certainly be cooler. 19th in the championship for Bargs. Now he's got a pretty well bashed up. Look at that. Open slather. It's a pretty amazing scene, isn't it? Don't see that too often. Good idea of what the roll cage looks like inside the V8 supercar. But he's actually performing very well. He's uh, in amongst it there at the moment, but um, he's in position 11. Black flag has been issued to Paul Radisich, car number 65. He'll have to do a uh, drive-through pit lane for a jump start, Neil. Isn't that just a crazy sight? Look at this, 9-8. Last one again for Ambrose, the margin. It's Christmas for him, that's what he needs, his own air. You heard Mark Scaife talk earlier about the fact that you tend to be easier on your rubber and on your car when you're in the lead. You've got pretty clean air, you've worked to your own rhythm, you're not being fumbled by anybody, you're not in anybody else's hot air. For Ambrose, that margin 1.2 seconds. His tander frustrated that he finds himself now battling in position six. We well, said before they had to uh, change the box in this car. They didn't touch anything in terms of the uh, suspension setup. The car looked very strong in that previous race. He was able to make effective passes and look after its tyres. The other guy that's come into contention a bit, you wouldn't have considered this yesterday, Matthew, was Russell Ingle, who's moved up to 14th. And uh, they're shuffling their cleanest dirty shirts when it comes to tyre management after losing four tyres yesterday. And uh, for him to be up there in that position is a pretty fair effort as well. Marcus Ambrose has the fastest time at 109.58. He also holds the race lap record as Stephen Richards shoots on by. The lap record stands from 2001, a 109.027 set by Marcus. So Canto's yet to stop. Just been passed by Richard Simon. Wills is in there as well. Remember that Canto is in position. He's in sixth at the moment. If you had to freeze the race at this particular point, that's what position he's in. Greg? Neil Paul Radisic has just come through pit lane to serve that drive through. It's cost him an enormous amount of track position. He rejoined at the rear of the just to clarify, the officials in pit lane say it is for a false or jump start at the beginning of the race, not for overlapping on the restart after the safety car. Two top dog awards for Paul Radisic for 2003, a fifth and an eighth in races one and two, and it's bumped him, well, two more spots up the championship ladder. He came here this weekend ninth on the table. He's now seventh. Greg Murphy is in second position in the race. One and a half seconds behind Marcus Ambrose. Jason Bright is third. Scaife right on his tail in fourth. Fastest lap so far recorded by Marcus Ambrose at 9.5. His margin's out to one and a half seconds. Scaife and Bright are arguing over third position. Ambrose, Murphy, Bright, Scaife, Tander, Richards, Canto, Simon Wills, John Bow in ninth. Then Jason Barguana in the top 10 with the door missing from that car. Then Ellery McConville, Ingle, Rita Brad Jones, Jamie Wincup. And when you consider the state of his car in that last event, he's up and amongst it. Both of these men have two pole positions here at Hidden Valley. Bright got the first one in 98 as a Ford driver and was the defending pole sitter until Scaife took it back yesterday and on the overall win tally Scaife has two overall round victories here at the Valley and Jason Wright the one back in 1999 and as I pointed out 
earlier, nobody has actually translated pole position into an overall round victory. And if this race continues to go the way it is, Marcus Ambrose will ensure that that record stays clear. Because he's in first position. Coming towards the halfway mark of the third and final race. And he's got that history on his mind. We've been talking about it. He knows about it. Alan Moffat, he wants to join him. Come back right after this. So tight, so close. The battle for third position. Mark Scape is so close to Jason Bright, he can feel that third position. Battle's been raging while we've been in the break. Up to turn four. Scape's got a little okay, bit more strength late in the stop and certainly in the early part of the turn in. Has a look up the inside of the valley and sneaks it in there. At the end of the day, Bright just yielded at the critical moment. Scape to third. Bright back to fourth. Just see there the HRT Mobile starting to pull away. This man is in second position, Greg Murphy. 2.1 seconds behind, that's what it looks like. Two seconds between him and the blue car in front. PlayStation 2 race score can recap it for you. Murphy's made up three spots since the start. That's actually a back marker in the way there, so two seconds is even further than what we thought. Good move from Russell Engel. He's up seven positions to be inside the top ten. Yeah, that's a fair comeback, isn't it? So they're sort of stringing the field out here now, and Marcus Ambrose is the man responsible for it because he's just pulling it further and further away. 2.2 seconds is the gap between first and second. Scafer's a couple of seconds behind Greg Murphy. And then Bright Tander make up the top five. Tanders marched up ahead yeah. of Bright now as well, just looking at that. So that's a couple of positions that Jason Bright has surrendered in the space of the last couple of laps. Let's get down to Greg Rust in pit lane. Greg? Well, Matthew, you were talking about Garth Tander here. It's been a bit of an expensive day as far as uh, the Gary Rogers team is concerned for his teammate, Jamie Wincup. Those of you that followed our coverage of the last race, have a look at this. Jamie had quite a big shunt with the tyre wall. This is the steering rack that came off car 33. You can see the damage on it. It's actually bent this end of the steering rack and broken the tyre rod end in the process. The expense bill keeps going. We go to the upright here. You can see the way the shock absorber has just broken completely away from it. And of course, all of this doesn't take into account panel work and man hours that have been required to fix car 33. They got him out there, but there's a fair bit of work being done by the boys. As so he uh, pulled up rail parked rail. on the side there, Rusty. And the rust bucket is starting to get a little bit fuller and fuller. There's a spare door somewhere around there, Rusty, that Jason Barquan is looking for if you want to throw that in the bucket Safety as well. Car. Safety car because Paul Dumbrell's race is over. He's over the tyre wall. And some fairly intense damage to the front right. So the Audi safety car has been called upon once again on lap 20. It's a get out of jail card for Mark Scape. And, uh, you know, Marcus got a terrific break there when Canto was mixed up in that pack. What's happened here? Look. Oh, I can tell you what's happened here. He's run into the back of somebody, damaged the radiator, and it's fried itself. And uh, what you're seeing there now is the um, end result of the engine running with no water or certainly pretty darn hot. So he's ended up uh, in the back of someone that's done pretty substantial damage around the front of the car. I don't know if that's a smile or a grimace, or maybe a... Well, it's definitely not a smile. <laughs> a mixture of the two. Paul Dumbrell is getting a very steep learning curve in the world of V8 supercars. Last year's Konica champion. This is the first time that he's raced here at, at Darwin. And Larry Perkins is doing everything he can to introduce him to the big bad world, even to the point of uh, confiscating his mobile phone because it was becoming such a nuisance, apparently. Paul Morris is... That's uh, Craig Baird in the Team Kiwi entry. He's in. We might take a break. Under safety car conditions means we're going to have another restart yet again. We'll come back to Hidden Valley. Marcus Ambrose had a 2.2 second gap.
on second place before that incident with Paul Dumbrell brought the safety car out. Now, the difference is so minimal. We'll see it all when they head to turn one for the restart. We'll come back to Darwin on your home of motorsport. A long, hot afternoon is ready to come to an end. With 11 laps left, the lights are out on the Audi safety car, and that means we'll have a rolling restart ready to go. 35 degrees outside. The average cabin temperature about 46, but Neil, when you are charging full tilt, all of a sudden you start slowing down at 80 k's an hour. Things start to cook even worse for a while there, wouldn't they? Well, several things happen. The uh, heat soak back through the floor from the pipes and everything under the car is just horrendous and you've got time to think about it which is even a bigger problem so this will be interesting it's uh, now bunched the field back up the safety car lights are out he'll peel off which he's done the Audi goes into the pit lane Ambrose is the way the first three are all in sync with each other they actually pulled a little gap there because Tanda can't pass until he gets alongside that start finish line area uh, pass I mean by actually coming up alongside Noski no change at the top of the field. Ambrose, Murphy and Scaife go through cleanly. Tanda in fourth position. Almost impact there for Stephen Richards. He had to take evasive action to the left-hand side of the track. Look at Jamie Winker. He's moved up 17 positions. Not bad effort for a car that was completely and utterly shattered at the end of race two. On the way into turn four, lots of people with rear brakes locked. Single file around the horseshoe that is turn five. Good time to take a, ooh, a little bit of a lock up for Greg Murphy. You'll know that Scape is ready to pounce. Check out the order of appearance as they come across the control line after the first flying lap. It doesn't look as though too many people have shuffled around, certainly not in the top three. Over they go, Ambrose, Jason 111.26. Jason Richards was shuffling down the, the order there. He was one of the reasons why there were people ducking and weaving at the back of the pack. And uh, someone's actually uh, right across on the full dirty side of the road there. This is Windcup and Lounge side by side into one. One of the shell cars in there as well, it's Max. Whoa. There's contact there too, contact on the way down, contact on the way out between Lounge and Jamie Windcup. The end wind cup gives up that position. So that's the battle for 15th and 16th. Garth Tanda has received a drive through penalty for overtaking before the control line. So exactly what you're talking about, Cromley. Yeah, I, I could sort of, I, I, it was difficult from the angle that we had of that, but it was running through my mind as he did it. I was sort of thinking, no, no, no. And it, it may not even necessarily be for passing, it could be for, an, for overlapping. You're not allowed to actually pull out and run alongside at all. But of course, Tanda would have been wanting to get on with it because the three lead guys got such a good jump. Car 7, Rodney Forbes, turn around there at the uh, turn 5 hairpin. It's just the front angle of it. it digs up a little bit more dirt, rejoins the race. This is the fight between Windcup and Craig Lowndes. Now they touch each other there, so that's one. You see Jamie's gone to the inside to cover, and then Craig's then just jammed it up the inside, grabbed the, the gas pedal, got track position back from him. And Got him again. Got him again. In terms of the uh, championship, David Bernard's day appears to be over. He was um, short-changed a bit in the first stop there. Okay. He got to go. Going. Going. That's a bit weird. And um, he actually had to sit and wait in that round of pit stops. And uh, there was a bit of a kerfuffle on the radio about uh, track position and priority there. He's uh, well down the order at the moment. And obviously, the problem where you've got a car that starts and stops for whatever reason, you've got a bigger problem. Remember, FPR have got three cars running out there. Here's Russell Ingle. Just a quick word on the championship. If they finish in this order, Jason Bright will still lead the championship after round six. Stephen Richards will still be second. And even if Marcus Ambrose wins here, which will make it four straight wins out of six, he'll be third on the championship ladder. Leaves you scratching your head. The championship point score. Another incident down here at uh, turn four. Greg Ritter, the double O car. Spun around and uh, nothing too 
major to speak of. Let's get down to pit lane, Daryl Beattie. I'm Danny with Todd Kelly. Todd, any insight into what happened with that incident earlier with you? No, I, I didn't see any of it. I, uh, I was just, you know, first corner, trying to stay out of trouble for the long race ahead. And uh, all I remember was coming out of turn one, you know, had, the car was in a straight line, and uh, somebody just hit me and put me straight into the wall. How are you as far as your body goes? It was a pretty big hit. Yeah, it uh, hooked up into the wall pretty hard and spun the car, which gave my neck a bit of a tweak, but uh, the, the car's torn up pretty bad, so the guys are going to be fairly busy trying to get it back on the track for next weekend. Thanks, Todd. Thanks. Yeah, it's hard to uh, get a full understanding of what occurred there. There were several cars in close proximity. I've got a feeling that the Dumbrell car was in there, and I think the Lowndes car was in there as well, and obviously the... Um, the stewards will take a look at that at the conclusion of the race and just see whether they can unravel what may have occurred. But he shot out of the pack and, as he just described, it just whacked the wall, something fierce, and uh, has ripped that car up. So there's going to be a lot of work down at Clayton for this race team, the Holden Racing Team. Scaife's threatening now. That's looking backwards from Greg Murphy's car. And Tander's serving his drive-through penalty for either passing before the control line or overlapping. And... Uh, Garth's clearly unhappy about it and uh, it's a situation that gets talked about a lot in the driver's briefings where a lap, where a driver is a lap down, um, you know, hustling them along to make sure they stay in the train. All these cars have got 620 odd, 30 odd horsepower. There's no reason at all why they can't all be line astern but for some reason there always seems to be an issue where there's lap traffic. We get some lag and um, drivers that are on the lead lap and fighting for position get extremely frustrated and clearly what's happened is that uh, Tanda has tried to hustle it on. Oh, Richards. Well, well that's not pretty. That was uh, pretty high speed impact. Jason Richards nose to tail at was turn it, one. And he got, uh, was it Canto? I didn't, didn't actually, have, it wasn't fully focused on the uh, better electric car. He's looking at Richards. Whoa, look at the turn in speed that Scaife's got. It was like this when he was making his way back early as well. He just had uh, great speed when he was chasing Jason Bright in that particular zone. He's, he's stopping power late in the stop and his turn in speed in sort of this zone here was very good in a couple of places where you need to carry speed on the way in. He's strong on the approach to turn one. It looks like he's pretty strong up at the complex at 8, 9, 10 as well. Remember that everybody's well and truly used all their tyres this weekend, so they've put on whatever combo they've got in this second part of the race after the tyre stop. Tyres are now pretty hot and mushy, 31 of 35 laps. They've got a lot to fight with. Join the boys tonight for Formula One after the movie on 10. Nürburgring in Germany, round nine. Kimi Räikkönen has pole position. Billy and Neil staying up late to bring you that one. See so Scafie just uh, searching for air there temperature rise in these cars if you stay tucked under the rear wing of another car in a place where the ambient temperature is high. Darrell? Paul, can you uh, give us any idea what happened with the car there? Yeah, on one of the restarts there, it's a bit of a concertina effect at the back of the pack and unfortunately it's got hit up the rear and up the front so uh, the car's just run a little bit hot and uh, unfortunately we've had to call the day. You've had a bit of a uh, biff and bad weekend. Yeah, it's been for the last couple of races, it's been a little bit disappointing, but um, you know, the car so had a lot of speed this weekend, which is the most disappointing thing, but um, you know, in Queensland in a couple of weeks we'll bounce back and hopefully have a good showing. Thanks, Paul. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Well, Gary Rogers, you've had a, a chance to look at the vision of the restart. Give us your take on it, uh, and was Garth in the wrong, do you think? To be quite frank, Greg, I haven't seen it, but my boys say that he did get to within perhaps what could be deemed as... Uh, in the wrong but look the fact of the matter is the car was a lap or two down the bloke wasn't even in the race the people have come to see a race I mean something has to be done about these people the rules it's just it's not right um, you know we'll cop it and we'll move on but I mean something does have to be done because people out there have paid their money and it really makes a sham of the whole thing Jeez, while Gary Rogers was talking Craig Lowndes almost leapt through our TV screens you're watching the rear here of it must be Jamie Wincup's car. No, it couldn't no, it's, be. It's Stephen yeah, Johnson it's looking Stephen backwards Johnson, from yeah. Stevie. And uh, Lowndes has got pace in some areas. So CL's kind of monstering him at the moment. But he's struggling a couple of others. And uh, they're all in a pretty angry pack here. See, he's real quick here. It's a little bit like Mark Scape. He's got pace right in this particular zone in turn one. 
and maybe not quite getting off the corners quite as well. And certainly Stephen was a little bit stronger coming onto the front straight. Craig Lowndes won the first ever race held, held here in 1998, but overall in the rounds he hasn't finished better than seventh. A little bit of a bogey track for Craig Lowndes. Here's Cameron McConville having a fight with the three-door mobile of Jason Bargwana. Brad Jones with the front left squealing a little bit on the way in five. Looks like he's got reasonable car pace. He, he set the fifth quickest time in the race earlier today in race two. And, uh, but the problem is it's not much good if you can't use it. That's where qualifying is so good. And that's why, in particular, Marcus and Mark Scaife have been enjoying such strength in recent weekends because they're qualifying well and racing in clean air. Isn't that just a bizarre sight? <laughs> About 10 to 15 kilograms lighter. It, well, it'd be fair old whack. I've never weighed a, a right rear door on a Falcon. I don't know, but it'd be a few. Mate, if you want, want to, to around for <laughs> there's one over at about turn two if you want to go for a wander. Just come back before the end of the race. You've got about two two laps to go. You'd, you'd be pretty stiff if you got nailed um, in post-race scrutineering for being underweight because <laughs> your, your door was missing. But I guess uh, things like that do happen from time to time. Just go and sort of gather it up and stand there and hold it. Battle between Murphy and Scaife on the top of your screen. Stephen Johnson so close. You can see the garbage on that screen. And uh, the, wa the wipe has been walking around on it as well. Look at this. Wind Cup's going to get up the inside of Lowndes. Oh, there's Biffo here. And Wind Cup makes a pass. Actually, Craig ended up... Uh, a little worse for wear here, and speaking of worse for wear, Brad's uh, rear bumper assembly and uh, re rear guard now touching that tyre. Only a few laps to go, so uh, in fact, a final lap, so you wouldn't do anything about it now, you let it smoke its head off. And out in front, Marcus Ambrose. What a performance. The final lap of this race as Brad Jones is going to lumber on home in car 21 with smoke from the rear. Cameron McConville is still determined to fight Jason Bargwana for 10th position. Barks is holding on to a top 10 -er. Probably the first three-door car to ever finish top 10. <laughs> Pretty good performance from Bargwana, in fact, because uh, he started off the back in yesterday's first race. So, whoa. Oh, speaking of, can you believe it? Can you believe it? Jason Bargwana holding on to a top 10 finish and finds himself on the grass. Ambrose goes through. Greg Murphy is there and Mark Scaife for the first time in five years. Might have won a round in five rounds. But Mark Scaife, Marcus Ambrose comes across the finish line and collects what is an historic victory. Four out of four, the first man for Ford in 26 years. To do that, Falcon Power is... Full ball. So Mark Scaife will finish second overall. He finished race three third. And Marcus Ambrose joins Alan Moffat as a Ford driver to win four straight rounds of the championship. Moffat won four in 73 and five in 1977. Man, this guy is hot. Yeah, he's just done a fantastic job. He's really in sync with his team. He's car confident. His car's working beautifully. They're setting it up well. When it isn't right, they know what to adjust, when and by how much which is always particularly important and impressive. It's just a tremendous job from the Stone Brothers. The numbers are starting to add up on Marcus Ambrose's side. He is a genuine championship threat, a genuine V8 superstar, no question. These are the results from race three, Shell Helix race score, as Ambrose, Murphy and Scaife on the podium. But after the break, we'll put it all in championship perspective once again, tell you who finished the round overall in what order. You know that Marcus Ambrose has won it. We'll come back and piece it all together after yet another eventful round here in the top end. And Mark Scaife couldn't do it. The pole to winner bogey stays here at Hidden Valley. It's Marcus Ambrose's day yet again. We'll take a break and come back.
Well, welcome back to Hidden Valley on an historic day for Ford fans. Not since 1977 has a Ford driver won four straight. Marcus Ambrose, you have done it today, and how does that feel? Yeah, look, uh, it's probably the toughest yet out of the four because you just had to work really hard. It's very hot. Escaping myself very close in times, and, you know, the start was so critical, and then the pit stops as well. So great job by the boys, and uh, Ken, who's been helping me on the starts, you know, we've just changed our fortunes this year, so... Credit to the team and, and what a great result, you know. Let's go five out of five, now home track. We always talk about the searing heat here in Darwin. How taxing was it on you personally today? It's easier out in front, I've got to say. Uh, <laughs> a couple of years ago, I was down the pack and and uh, that was really hard work. But when you can, when you know you can drive the car and, and win it by just looking after the tyres and things, you know, it makes it so much easier. Roll on Queensland, well done. Yeah, thank you, Rusty. Mark, it's been a difficult weekend with starts and also that first corner getting hung out high. Yeah, a little bit. Darrell, I, uh, I, I mean, I missed a gear in the second race, probably cost me the weekend, to be honest. Um, I should have been on pole for the last race if you don't do anything silly. And, uh, and you know, the last start was a good start between the two of us again. We were absolutely alongside each other, but I couldn't get across to the inside. So then, as you said, you know, you get hung wide, you take the long tour, and you never, you never go any good on the long tour, do you? Especially when Garth or one of the good guys are on the inside. We are going to see the new car at the next round. Yeah, absolutely. We'll roll it out there. And, uh, I mean, you know, I think this is really encouraging. I mean, the car, whenever we've sort of been able to have a finish and, you know, the bounce of the ball probably hasn't really gone our way so far. But uh, when we, uh, you know, when we finally get the other one out, we'll be up there somewhere. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Tom. Well, that round victory has eluded you so far, but, boy, good points again. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the priority. When, when we're not in a position to win it like we are this weekend, and, you know, the testing's really starting to hurt us now. I mean, you know, late in the race, we just haven't got the tyres that all three guys have got in front of us at the moment. So... You know, we, we need to get out testing and hopefully that you know, testing ban will be lifted soon and we can go out and try and catch these guys. Great weekend, Jace. Well done. Thanks, Greg. Rusty mentioned another good points haul for Jason. 76 points for Bridie for finishing third today. That's the top 10 overall for round six here at Hidden Valley. Ambrose Scape and Bright the podium. Greg Murphy holding on to fourth. Stephen Richards holding on to fifth. And another top 10 performance for Paul Wheel. As far as the championship is slated after six rounds, well, nothing has really changed. Jason Bright maintains that championship lead. Stephen Richards holds on to second. And Marcus Ambrose, despite winning four straight now, is still in third position. But what about Mr. Consistency, Stephen Richards? He just refuses to let go of that second position. He's with Neil Crompton. Well, he scored 158 points today, and I think Stephen Richards is a bit of a get-out-of-jail card that you played. You qualified 16th, but you raced very effectively as usual. I think it was a 9th, a 6th, and a 5th. You'd be pleased with that. No, very happy, very happy. We're uh, still trying to unlock the secrets of the VY, but um, look, we're, we're battling a bit, I must admit, in the races, but obviously good enough for 5th place. So, yeah, the, the, the team are very happy. Stevie, you... Um you obviously had a good test or a couple of good tests with that car and you felt as though you had a good understanding of it. You had two great practice sessions here and we thought you were going to be amongst it. Then come qualifying was a bit of a horror story. Why was that and what was the specific issue? I mean, really, not, not quite sure. We basically put the new tyres on. The track temperature had risen a bit and absolutely, totally accept, uh, expected to do a mid-eight and didn't and went a little bit slower. So I'm um, not sure. We, we had a little bit of a problem we, we recognised with the front of the car and that's really been consistent the whole weekend and that's that stopped stopped us gaining a bit of mid corner speed and that that's having a massive effect on our, on our on our genuine lap speed so we need to work on that and with the car being a bit of a handful how was fitness and what was the temperature like the fitness was all right but it was bloody hard work i mean when when the car's nice to drive you really do it quite easy as you know but um when it's a handful mate well mate i was, I was glad to see the checkered flag <laughs> thanks for that mate we look forward to seeing you in queensland good job thanks a lot Stephen Richards, who unveiled a new VY. Remember, Scape will unveil his, but this man, well, he just continues to celebrate. The trophy collection is just getting plentiful by the minute, isn't it, for Marcus Ambrose, and the champagne collection is getting even better as well. So four on the trot now for Marcus Ambrose. He is hot to go, isn't he? Let's check out what's ahead on your home of motorsport. Formula One tonight after the movie. Join Billy and Neil Crompton with Kimi Räikkönen on pole in Nürburgring. That is coming up later tonight, round nine of the Formula One Grand Prix. Now, we'll show a replay of the 250 cc's in the MotoGP category, of course, with Ant West winning, so we want to see that again. That will follow your Formula One, and the next time you'll see the V8 supercar circuit will be at the Queensland Raceway here at Darwin. It belongs to Marcus Ambrose yet again. We'll see you next time on your home of motorsport.
the worst, if not the worst, Stewart's decision I have ever seen.